All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from beautiful blue sky, San Diego. Quarantine, but blue skies, what can I say? And I'm joined by our old friend who's come back uh, to, to visit with us again, Rusty Kamori, who's over in beautiful Hawaii. How are you doing, Rusty? Oh, so great to be back with you, John. Yeah, absolutely. And Rusty's a sought-after motivational speaker, host of Think Tech Hawaii's program, Beyond the Lines, and author of these two best-selling books. This is the first one, Beyond the Lines, uh, which was about creating a leadership culture. And his new book, which is Beyond the Game, Coaching for Peak Performance in Sports, Business, and Life. And first, before we get into it, uh, uh, Rusty, because you're going to talk about coaching, um, for those of you who haven't seen our, our previous interview, we don't know, uh, Rusty was head tennis coach at, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the school, what was it? Punahou School. Punahou School in Honolulu, where he led the boys' varsity team to 22 consecu consecutive state championships. That's 22. That's amazing. And so, obviously, uh, Rusty knows a lot about coaching. So first, um, your, your first book was uh, about uh, creating a leadership culture. This one is is about coaching. So Rusty, I guess the first question is always is was the most fundamental one is what is coaching? Because sometimes people don't really understand what coaching is. They confuse it with managing, they confuse it with directing, and they confuse it with teaching. Yeah, I think there's a there's a big difference between coaching and teaching. Um, we've all had amazing teachers in our lives and. Oftentimes, teachers uh, focus on one part. Uh, they might be focusing on a subject like math or a skill like playing piano. And the difference with coaching is coacher, coaching uh, people, you, they focus more on the whole of the person, not just a part of them. And mm -hmm. that's what I want um, all teachers to do, all coaches to do, all parents, all business leaders, all head coaches to focus on the whole of the person rather than just a part of the person. Yeah, because I think it's 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 interesting. You're correct. I mean, when you're teaching somebody something, you're as you say, you're focused on the skill itself. You're not focused on the, the person in their totality or what they and especially in in a work context. Um, if you're going to coach somebody, you have to understand all the different dimensions of that person, right? Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a huge thing is to really know who you're dealing with and, and how to connect with them because connecting with them is, is what it's all about. Yeah, because let's face it, I mean, different people react in different ways to things. So if you take a one size fits all, it's not going to, uh, not going to go very far. So you also focus in on, on choices. And this is, I love that you actually have, a, cha have a, a piece and a chapter on choices because I think for me, I think that's what people hate the most. People hate making choices. And they don't realize oftentimes by not making choices, they're making choices. But, <laughs> but, it's, but it's like they don't want to because the minute you choose one thing, you, you often by default unchoose a bunch of other things and we just don't like to let go of any option. <laughs> I totally agree with you. And, you know, for me as a coach, as a leader, I want to, one of the biggest things is I wanted to have my players uh, choose better choices and mm -hmm. knowledge is power. And the more we know, the better choices we can make. Yeah. So how do you help people to understand that and, and to, to gain the knowledge to make better choices? Because this, and especially kind of nowadays, we live in this strange world where people, uh, or just act on instinct or they want to take shortcuts. So they don't really, they just going to go with, oh, that feels good. I'm just going to do it. So how do you help people actually take a step back and go through a process before making a choice? I think the biggest thing is to really find out what is important to them. What are mm -hmm. their goals? I mean, what is, what do they want to achieve? And oftentimes as a coach, as a leader, you might have your own agenda and you might want your team to fit your agenda, but oftentimes the best leaders will adapt, you know, their agenda to the team or the talent that they might have around them. Uh, but you, you only really know what your players or your team members uh, really care about if you, if you communicate and talk to them. Yeah. And here's an interesting one, Rossi. How often does this happen? Because this is something that I've kind of 
learned over time is that we sometimes assume that people know their own motivations or know what's important to them, but oftentimes they haven't really sat down and thought about it or nobody has actually posed that question to them. You know, what is, what does motivate you? And I think obviously until you can discover that, it's kind of hard to move forward. But how often have you seen that where people actually don't know and need the help, you need to be pointed in a d- the direction of actually examining it? You know, that's funny you bring that up, John, because after we would have our tryouts, I would meet with each person individually. And oftentimes that's when I would ask them, hey, you know, what do you think your strengths are? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it's funny because sometimes what a person might perceive as a strength might not actually be one. And so for me, I like to listen first and speak last. Mm -hmm. So I like to have them tell me what they think their strengths are. And at the end of the meeting, I'll, I'll tell them what I think their strengths are. And oftentimes that really opens their eyes and that starts to really get them excited and motivated because they had no idea that they do other things really good until I highlighted that. And then, um, and then once you get that, obviously, as you say in your book, uh, you know, communication is key. We talked about that. Talk, talk to me a little about culture, because culture gets thrown around a lot. And I don't really think a lot of people understand what culture is. And I also think that a lot of things that are, a lot of culture in organizations and teams happens by either by evolves by default because nobody is deliberate about it or they just take it from the leader and that's it and however the leader acts that's what the culture is i think uh culture is really standards you know how Mm -hmm. high of a standard do you want to live by i mean do you want to just be like hey you're we're mediocre we're average (laughs) you know and be proud of that or do you want to have uh, and, and a culture of excellence, or do you want to have a superior culture of excellence? I mean, how do you become an elite team, an elite organization? How do you become number one in business for one year or two years or 10 years? And so it's a matter of really finding that core. I mean, what, what, what do you want to be known for? What's your identity? And it all starts with the head coach or the CEO. Sure. And for me, you know, I would often tell our guys, I'd say, hey, when we would play certain, you know, really tough, challenging teams, I would say, hey, you know, these teams, they're going to give us some great effort and have a have a great attitude against us. Right. And our guys would be like, yep. And I said, well, we can't do the same. And they're like looking at me thinking, what do you mean, coach? And I said, well, we have to give superior effort and mm. have a superior attitude. I said, we can't do what they do. We have to do more. And I think when you do those things, that becomes your culture. And mm-hmm. when you, as the leader, starts to you know, explain why you're doing it, communicate why you're doing certain things, share with them what you're thinking, what you're feeling, then you avoid a lot of misperceptions and misunderstandings with your team. And then that becomes a culture. It becomes very contagious. And it's, it's good to hold yourself and others, you know, with a higher standard. And for me, I would tell my team that, you know, I'm going to hold myself to this high standard and I expect you to do the same. And it, it's something that really went hand in hand. Yeah, and I love what you said there about a, a, a culture of excellence and results, et cetera, because I hear a lot, especially now that uh, during the this uh, pandemic crisis where there's a lot of organizations have been forced to work remotely. We are fortunate we've been doing that, uh, running largely a virtual organization for about six, seven years. And we made that as a strategic decision and we actually find it better and more productive. But I hear this thing about, oh, but it's so hard to to build culture when people aren't in a building or in a, in a physical location together. And I go back to exactly what you said. Culture isn't Culture isn't based on proximity. Culture isn't based on having parties or everybody wearing orange T-shirts or whatever it is. Culture is based on having a shared understanding, a shared expectations, and a shared understanding of ex- uh, of what is expected and the results. And then having a results culture. And then people will work together and build that, regardless of whether they're virtual or physical. They'll they'll build that together because they know the standards, as you said, that they're expected to reach. Yeah, you know, when you're on a team, 
you are a reflection of your team and your mm-hmm. team is a reflection of you. And I would often say that we can do 99 things right. If we did one wrong thing, everyone would only remember that one wrong yep, thing. That's for sure. Especially when you're in the spotlight, you know, when you're number one, everyone mm-hmm. is gearing up to try to take you down. So I would tell my guys, it's a privilege to be in that situation. And think about how many other teams would love to be in our position. So we can never do that one wrong thing. So let's talk. You have one of the one of the keys here is is physical, and that might surprise people a little bit uh, in terms of if they're you know it's not a, if it's not a sports team, it's a company, it's a team within an organization. Tell to me a little bit about why the physical is still very important. Yeah, so the physical part is, it's actually two parts. It's you as a leader and you as a team. And Mm -hmm. so for you in business, it's how good are you at your task? How good are you at doing what you do physically? You know, are if you're a leader and you're running a a meeting, are you really, really great at it? Or are you just average at it? I mean, that's a physical thing that you're doing is leading a meeting. I mean, are you inspiring people to really get excited to get things done? Or are, are they just thinking, when is this meeting going to end? <laughs> yeah, and, and I love that because I don't think people often make that connection between that these are physical activities or, as you say, like running a meeting or giving a presentation or whatever it is. These are physical activities that if you're not if you're not up to scratch on, you can have a detrimental impact. Okay, and, and then let's talk about the, uh, the mental part. Yeah, so John, you know, it's, it's amazing because since my first book came out and now my second book is coming out, I've been doing a lot of guest speakings for many businesses mm-hmm. and organizations and a lot of them had hired me back to do a beyond the lines training. And right. a lot of the training, I, I focus on these six keys for peak mm-hmm. performance. And when I'm sharing with them about the physical part or the mental part, um, they've never looked at things in this way. And I and they would ask me a lot of these CEOs would be asking me, you know, is this what you did? And I said, yeah, this is what I would do. And if you if you can do all six keys um, to the best that you can, that leads to peak performance, which leads to winning. And the mental part is really about mental toughness. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, mental toughness is the ability to create and maintain the right kind of, um, you know, attitude, that right kind of focus, regardless of the circumstances. So if, if, some, if your coworker treats you badly, if you had a, a bad phone call with a client and, it, and they were re- really rude to you, regardless of that circumstance. So that's what mental toughness is, is your ability to focus, to go from one task to the next at that highest level of ability that you're capable of doing. And I think this is a time when a lot of that is being tested, obviously, with people around the world right now with all of this uncertainty. And in in a lot of cases, you do need that mental toughness to just keep your business focused and moving forward uh, allowing for the fact that you don't have all the necessary information about what's going to happen in the future. But in the meantime, I think people are looking for that kind of strong leadership. Yeah. And John, you know, that's, that's, it's a mindset. It's um, mm-hmm. it's an attitude. It's a perspective. And, you know, some people see the clouds and storms of a situation mm-hmm. and champions always see the sun peeking through and the yeah. best leaders always provide hope. They always provide positively, uh, positivity, but they, they provide the facts, you know, yeah. and, and it's a perspective, it's a mindset. And for me, at the beginning of every season, I would always share with my team that we're going to have some major adversity this year. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. <laughs> and some of my guys before a certain playing a certain match, you know, they would come up to me and say, hey, coach, is today the day we're going to have it? <laughs> and I'm like, guys, today is not the day. <laughs> and the next day we have a match, you know, against a tough school. They're coming up to me saying, hey, coach, is today the day? And I'm like, guys, today is the day. And <laughs> because we're expecting adversity, we're, we're looking forward to challenges. We yeah. can, rather than hoping and praying that it doesn't happen, 
And then when it does happen, we just feel like, you know, it's, it's just something that we're just not prepared for. Yeah. And I love that. And I think that's a great message for people. And that is, uh, the fact that if you're prepared and you know you're good and you've got everything going is that you should look forward to those challenges because it gives you an opportunity to prove how good you are and maybe even surprise yourself a little. And then you have uh, another of the keys is, is the emotional piece, right? And I guess right now that is probably something a lot of people are struggling with is getting people in the right, with the right attitude right now, with the right mood, all of those things. Uh, so how do you keep, how do you help people if you like, uh, understand and control maybe and become more um, in charge of their emotions as opposed to driven by them? Yeah, so one of the first things uh, with that third key of the emotional part is to really have them be aware of their emotions Mm -hmm. and the emotions of others around them. And some people are, they might just be self centered where they're only focused on their emotions and they're totally not caring about anybody else's emotions. Um, But, you know, to really help them understand that, to have the awareness, but to also let them know that decisions must be based on reason, not Mm -hmm. emotion. So many people make irrational, emotional decisions, which really comes to bite them, you know, sooner or later. Um, so it's really, it's really having the awareness. That's, that's the biggest thing. I always tell my guys that, you know, you're always in one of three situations when you're competing. So whether it's in sports or business, you're either winning, losing, or tied, right? Your attitude and effort should always be fantastic. Why do some people perform differently when they're winning and they perform completely differently when they're losing? You know, so it's a matter for me, I'm sharing with them about, you know, let's focus on winning the marathon okay, Mm -hmm. versus winning the sprint. So if we if we win the first set, that might be winning the sprint. Well, that doesn't guarantee that we're going to win the match. That doesn't guarantee we're going to win the marathon. Same Mm -hmm. if we lose the first set, we lost the sprint doesn't mean we're going to lose the marathon. So I want everyone to compete and perform the best that they can, every single point, go from in business, go from one task to the next, from one meeting to the next, to the best that they can. And and if they can do that, that leads to peak performance as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's great advice, particularly now is that you have to put one foot in front of the other and do it to the best of your ability right now. Acknowledging the fact that we don't know, there's a lot of unknowns out there. But what's your choice? Your choice is, as you say, maybe you lost the first set. What's your choice? Like put down your racket and go home or or feel sorry for yourself and go out and lose the second set even even by even more. No, you have to you have to pick yourself up, put one foot in front of the other and say, okay, I'm going to do the best job I can. Peak performance, not knowing where this is going to lead right now. But for now, I'm just going to keep moving forward. Yeah. And John, you know, it's, it's all about controlling everything you have control of yeah. and not worrying about things beyond your control. Exactly. So with this coronavirus situation, people have to really think about um, necessary stress versus unnecessary yeah. stress. You know, what are things that you have total control of versus things that are beyond your control? Mm-hmm. And if you can do that, you know, whether it's in business, sports or life, it's going to help you tremendously. Yeah. And I think that's a, I think that's a great point to end on uh, here. And I'd like, actually, you've got one last chapter here, Inspiring Hope, I just wanted to touch on because I think it's a good message for now. But to your point, I think even, even putting the uh, pandemic aside right now, even at the best of times, people do spend a lot of time stressing on external factors of which they have zero control. I mean, if you're in a small business or in a business and you're stressing about the world global economy, right? Well, the world global economy is what it is and it's going to go where it's going to go. And you're stressing on it's probably not going to have that big an impact on it. But you can control the factors around you. And I think now is a good time for people to remind themselves. But let's talk a little bit about inspiring hope to finish. Yeah, for me as a, as a coach, you know, Again, when you're playing somebody, you, you might play somebody better than you, mm-hmm. equal to you, or lesser than you. And 
if, if I have a player on a court that's playing somebody that's better than him, okay, how can we win? How are upsets? How do upsets happen? Okay. So for me, I, I would share with my guy, Hey, you don't have to be better than your opponent at everything. We just have to figure out one situation that you're better at and do that one situation over and over and over right. again, first point to match point, And that's going to give you a chance for victory. And so even in businesses, when I'm, when I'm having a lot of meetings with these CEOs, I'll ask them, Hey, what's that one thing that you guys do really well? And rate that from one to 10. And I, I find it surprising that the one thing that they think they do really well, they might only rate it a seven. Right, and right, yeah. Rating it a nine or 10. <laughs> so they're like, Coach Rusty, how, how can we improve on that? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, if, you're, if you're rating the, the best thing you do at a six or a seven, that's not very good. <laughs> you're not very good at your best thing. But I think that's great. I do think that, that that's an, another important message for even now and, and just in, in general times as well, is that uh, – uh, not to always look at it. Say you're competing in business, you're competing against the 800 pound gorilla in the market, right? You could just always throw your hands up and say, well, I'm never going to beat them. Or as you say, you could say, well, I over service my customers. They don't really pay that much attention to them. I've got an advantage there, right? I've got an advantage that I can push, I can just over service everybody and have people so delighted that they go, yeah, I can live without some of the things that the 800 pound gorilla brings because I like the way you treat me. Yeah, you know, it's it's just believing in in yourself and as a coach, as a leader, really inspiring hope in your team that they can find a way to win. Everyone's capable of doing so much more than they think they're capable of doing. And it's the leader's job to really open their eyes to show them that hey, you can do that. You can there's a chance. And if you feel like there's a chance you can win, Hey, you have that chance versus thinking I got no chance at all. So, you know, that's, that's just a great lesson in life is, you know, if you really think you can, you, you have a chance. Yeah. And I think that's a great message for everybody right now is that it's, it's not, it's not sticking your head in the sand or, or being unrealistic. There is uh, optimism and hope generates a certain energy and it often can make you think more clear um, in, with more clarity so you can actually find the way forward. So I would encourage people right now, even at this time when things are tough, is like, be optimistic and be positive because it does create, it does create an energy and it will help you get through this because sometimes you don't know how you're going to get through it, but having some optimism and positivity will help you find that way. Yeah, just think about what losers do, okay? When, when, when losers lose, you know, oftentimes they were negative, they were doubting themselves, they were mm. getting irritated and frustrated. And, but I, I challenge my players to do everything that helps you win. Do what champions do, okay? So if you can be positive, if you, if you can be smart, find a way to work hard, find a way to to tolerate things, to persevere, that's when you, that's when you win. That's when you become a champion. I don't know of any champion that's just negative and pessimistic <laughs> and just like not fighting hard and they, they, they're not going to become a champion. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like that. It's like when, when somebody like that does actually lose a match or something, what do they do? They go away and they try to learn the lessons from it. What does, what does a loser do? They go in, they say, well, the umpire was against me. That, though, that ball was in. Uh, that guy, he's on steroids, whatever. <laughs> yeah, the excuses, they just keep coming. And, and you know, champions, they don't, they don't make any excuses. Yeah. They often say the best excuse is the one we never make. Yeah, there you go. That's that's a perfect place to finish. So again, uh, just before we go, Rusty, just tell people a little more about the book and uh, where it's available. Well, so Beyond the Game is my new uh, second book. It's the sequel to Beyond the Lines, and it's available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And um, I hope everybody enjoys it. I mean, I know it's highly anticipated with a lot of uh, CEOs who have bought the first book and using the first book as a training tool for their companies mm -hmm. with their employees. And uh, I know that they're excited to do the same with the second one. 
Yeah, and I highly recommend it. And it's it's really nice. It's a nice length. There's no excuse, right? There's no excuse for you people with short attention spans or people say, oh, I can't read something. It's nice length. It's got some great stories in it and some and it's got some great pictures to to actually show you uh, some of Rusty, the people Rusty's worked with. So listen, Rusty, as usual, this has been fantastic. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. All of Rusty's information will be in his in his bio below this. So please click on and click on his books. And uh, I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.